Could you explain 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35? Would you go ahead and put that up on the overhead, please? Should be in with the announcements, I think. Second one. Second slide. Yeah. Actually, while we're, we're pulling that up, put the first slide up real quick. Um, this year, we talked last week, I want this year for us to focus on a couple things, one of which is scripture memorization. Okay. Um, it is something that God wants us to do, to know his word. Read Psalm 119, and you'll see how significant and important the word is. Okay. Uh, so our first memory verse for 2019 is Psalm 119.11. Okay. And you can, you can memorize it in whatever translation works for you. Um, you know, you can tell at what point in my life I was reading what Bible by what verses I quote. Because when I was a child, it was all King James. And then uh, for my 16th birthday, I got the, uh, the NIV. And so from then up until um, probably about a decade ago, it was NIV. Now some of it's NASV and other is ESV. And sometimes I just mix them all up, okay? So this is the, the memory verse. And I chose this one because of what it says. Um, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, okay? I have stored your word. Uh, some of them say I have hidden your word. Uh, others have, have, may have a different rendering on it, but the idea is that we have taken it and we put it in a safe place, okay? We put it in a safe place. Why? So that we would know what sin is and what we should not be doing. Okay? So this is the first memory verse. We're going to have this up for a couple weeks. So um, read it. Stick it in places where you'll read it several times a day. If you have an audio Bible, listen to it over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? Let it get deep into your soul. Let it saturate. Okay? So go ahead and go to the, the next scripture. The question is, could you explain 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35? I don't want to. <laughs> okay, here's, here's the passage. Uh, actually, I'm going to back up. Where did I start on there? 34. I'm going to back up real quick. Now, depending on your translation, uh, there are, there's a break. Some uh, translations put a break in verse 33, okay? Um, what we are looking at in 14 is, is uh, a part of a series that Paul is working through on how the, sh the church should operate, okay? Uh, it started way back in chapter 11, um, talked about hair and head coverings. And then it, Paul took a little bit of a, a right turn and he talked about communion. We talked about that earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he comes back to how the church should work in chapter 12 and he talks about the, uh, the body <coughs> and how there is no one part of the body that is ind indispensable. They are all necessary. You can't say, I don't need the body of Christ, I'm going to do it on my own. Neither can the body of Christ say, no, we don't need you, get out. Okay? Um, but there's a caveat to that, and that's church discipline. Okay? So that's, that's a separate issue. Uh, but Paul says that the, the head of the body is Christ, and all of us are members and, and then he goes into uh, one of his explanations of the gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. Now this, I do not believe, this is a list that is supposed to explain totally all of the gifts that God give us, gives us. Uh, I think Paul was uh, just talking about how this looked and the gifts and how they operate. Uh, when we wrap up a family affair, uh, we're going to get into the gifts of the Spirit and we're going to take a look at uh, a couple of the passages that, that are written about that. But he talks about... 
the gifts, and he talks about their function, and then he comes down uh, right in the middle of this, uh, right at the end of 13, the, in the middle of this, this passage, uh, if you look in verse 31 of chapter 13, now, chapter 13 is known as the love chapter. Okay, This is where Paul uh, kind of lists out what love is, and by inference, what it isn't. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians 13, I'm sorry, uh, 12, we're going to jump into 13 in a second. So the last verse in 1 Corinthians 12, um, he's talking about all of these gifts, and he talks about um, not everybody is going to have every gift. And then he, in verse 31, he kind of shifts gears. He says, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Okay, so Paul is throwing the brakes on him. He says, hey, you know, this is, how, this is what God has done. This is what a spirit is doing within the body of the church. But the church, by inference, I'm, I'm saying by inference and by experience, because I've been in churches that did this, there was such a passion for the gifts that they forgot the fruit. Okay? When you are sealed unto God, His Spirit seals you. Okay? That is the promise. It's the guarantee of our salvation. Okay? If His Spirit lives in you, it is going to start producing fruit of the Spirit. Okay? You see that in Galatians. All right? Um, Churches of antiquity and churches of today sometimes get so excited about the gifts of the Spirit that they forget that the higher calling is the fruit of the Spirit. So Paul is saying, hey, these are the things that the Spirit has given us to make it work right, to function, uh, to, be, to be properly disposed. Um, but I'm going to show you a more excellent way, a better way. And then he goes in to the chapter about love. Okay. And what's interesting is he starts off the chapter basically disqualifying every one of the gifts if they are not used in love. <laughs> okay. So then we go down and he, he, he gives the explanation, he gives the indication, he gives the example, uh, and then he comes down at the end of uh, chapter 13 um, and he says, you know, faith, hope, and love abide of these three, but the greatest of these is love. Well, then he gets into chapter 14. Now, keep in mind, he didn't write chapters. He didn't write verses. He just wrote one letter, okay? And most likely, he didn't write it. He probably dictated it, okay? So, uh, in chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially uh, that you may prophesy. So, see, he, he kind of comes full circle. He, he talks about the gifts, and then he says, but there's, there's a better way, and then he ends up right back with the gifts. We're to desire the gifts. We're not to shut them out. But they've got to be motivated by love. That's the whole force behind it. Not that you think it's being done wrong, or you think it needs to be done a different way. It, it's to be done in love. Okay, so then he gets into 14 and he comes back to the church and he's speaking specifically about the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. Okay, and uh, does anybody have in chapter 14 um, a, a title block before verse 26? The, the little caption at the top? Does anybody have anything else? Orderly worship, okay? See, I think this is the whole crux of what Paul is trying to tell the first Corinthian church. No. Well, yeah, it could have been the first. I don't know. It's not like the first Baptist church. The church in Corinth in the first letter. So, he talks about the order. He talks about this, the gifts. He talks about the fruit. He qualifies his discussion about the gifts. And then he comes to orderly worship. And he talks about how the church should be running. Now, there's a couple things before I get into this that I want to say to you. The first thing is, um, when looking at these couple chapters, I, I don't think there are very many other chapters in the Bible that have caused such division in the church. Okay? Because the things that he's talking about, you know, you have... Uh, on, on one extreme, 
um, the die-hard, uh, charismatic, and Pentecostal movement that, um, you know, it, it's all about 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, and then you have on the opposite extreme the, the more Calvinistic and, and uh, traditional teaching and, and the Baptist teaching that, no, 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 no. Uh, see, th this is disqualified for today because everything was met. Okay, I, I, I don't hold with either view. I, I try and stick to what this says, okay? Um, so, first thing is you have to come into this with the understanding that what Paul is teaching can be divisive. But you cannot disqualify what Paul is teaching because you don't like it, okay? Because it doesn't appeal to you. One of the greatest difficulties that we have in America today is the cultural mindset that we have. We have a very consumer prospering mindset, okay? Uh, we think things are tough when gas goes above $3 a gallon. We get upset if they don't have the right kind of flavor for our coffee. Um, we, we have these things that God has blessed us so abundantly and we have this, this difficulty kind of sliding into the mindset that we deserve it. Um, you look at the churches in Asia and Africa and the Middle East, those people are much more deserving of, of these things than we are if it was to be based off of works. Okay. So, first thing is, um, Paul's writings are scripture. If you're not sure about it, Peter says that they are to be considered as scripture. Okay? If you're not sure about it, God included it in his word for us today. Okay? So, you know, if the reference of Peter is not sufficient for you, the reference of God should be. Okay? So, he goes through and he starts talking about order. One of the things that I absolutely hate, and, and I try very hard not to do it, I know sometimes I probably do, because I'm not aware of it, um, but one of the things that I hate is when people disqualify scripture. Okay? I, I, it just drives me up a wall. Um, Paul wrote the letter to whom? Uh, somebody flip back to chapter 1, verse 2. And read that for me, please. In the church of God that is in court, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Okay, so who is Paul writing to? Every Christian. Well, the letter is addressed to the Corinthians, but he's sending it to the whole church, to everybody that's sanctified, everybody that believes. Why? Because it applies. Yeah. Okay, so here's, here's the dilemma that we have today. What are we supposed to do with the word that flies seemingly contradicts our culture, our mindset? What do we do? Well, here's the thing. These two verses are taken... We have this whole thing about ordering worship and prophecy and, and uh, when people are to stand up, when they're to sit down, when they're to share. Um, oh, I just, just missed it. Um, then he comes down. Um, depending on your passage in verse 33, um, there are two components to verse 33. Now, some passages append the end of verse 33 to the previous verses. Some translations append it to the following verses. So it's either the conclusion of what came right before it, or it's the intro to what's coming after it. Okay? Um, either reading works. Okay? So, <clears throat> uh, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, if we take that passage, just that. It sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? 
it sounds unfair. It, it does not sound equitable. Okay. So if this is the word of God, and we take these two verses out of the context in which they were written, and out of the understanding why they are written, people can get upset, can't they? Oh, Lord, yes. Oh, my, people get really upset um, because they don't want it to be this way. Okay? Now, one of the first rules of Bible study, and I've, I've repeated this numerous times, can somebody tell me what the first rule of hermeneutics is? Address be interpreted in light of all scripture. Scripture interpreted is to be interpreted in light of all scripture. What does that mean? It means that you can't just take one piece out of it and apply your own thinking to it. You have to take it in context to the verses before and after, and not just that, you have to take it uh, in reference to the rest of scripture. Okay? And this is very important that we do this here because if we just use those two verses and then we hold up the verses in Galatians and Colossae that say that there is neither Jew nor Greek, uh, male nor female, bond or free, all are equal. And if we believe that Christ offered salvation, the same salvation to men and to women, that there is equity in those things, how does that fit with this? Does it fit with this? It absolutely does. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain. Keep in mind, guys, I am a finite being. Okay? I err. I make mistakes. So what I am going to share with you is actually something that uh, about 24 years ago, God brought to mine and Christie's attention. Um, we were in a period, we had graduated Bible school, and we were involved in a church. Uh, we were running the youth center in Victor, and uh, there were some things that were going on that concerned me. And one day after service, I was, I was really pretty upset, and uh, I, I went to 1 Corinthians 14, and I was looking at the passage about prophecy and, and uh, speaking in tongues, and I asked Christy, I said, well, look, this, this is not... Orderly, how can we let this happen? And she, she, was, she was pretty upset because she said, well, if that applies, then what do we do with the women speaking in the church? Does that apply too? Keeping in mind that we grew up in a church, we grew up in a thinking that, was, that, that leaned to the equality side and away from the, the harsh side. Uh, my mother was an ordained pastor, an ordained minister. Um, Christy actually wrote... Uh, one of her thesis papers on uh, women in the church, the role of women in the church. Um, I'm sorry? Which is essentially why it's okay for women to be in leadership in the church. Right. Um, and God took us to this place. Now, between us, we have about seven years of Bible school. And, and we got into this church and things were going on and God was stirring things up and essentially what he asked us is why do you believe what you believe? Well, because that's what we were taught. And then he said, okay, what does my word say? Well, I could go back to the theology, I could go back to the doctrine that I was taught and I could pull out those key passages but I would exclude any that disagreed with me. Okay? Or I would try to reason them away. Okay? The, the, this scripture is not for. Okay. The first issue that we had to deal with was the role of women in the church. Now, the first thing I want to say, and I want to make sure you guys understand, is that women in the church have the same value as men. Okay? God doesn't look uh, at, at me and say, well, you know, you're a step up from Christy. No. Because the same price was paid for me as was paid for her. He, he didn't, you know, well, the blood from this finger is for the women and all the rest of the blood is for the men. His blood covers all of it. Okay. When he came, 
John 3.16, for God so loved the world. The world. Um, so, so we understand that God ascribes value to everyone. Okay? So, understanding that, the second thing that we need to understand is that our culture, our thinking is very tainted by uh, everything around us. Okay? Now, um, I, I got a question that I want the women to be thinking about for next week. Okay? So, women, take a note and, and just, I want you to answer this question. What is it about submission to your husband that concerns you? Okay? What is it about submission to your husband concerns you? Okay? And, and next week when we get into the role of husbands, um, we're, we're going to kind of start there and work our way through it. So, here we go. All scripture is interpreted in light of all scripture. So we take this passage, we can't take it just by itself. We have to look at the verses before, we have to look at the verses that follow. The entirety of what Paul is dealing with here is orderly service. <clears throat> orderly worship. Okay? Um, if then, we back this up, uh, go back to um, chapter 11, if you would please. So in chapter 11, um, we're, we're dealing with orderly service, orderly worship. Um, uh, I'll just pick up in verse 2. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaved. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her, uh, let her cover her head. Okay, and then, then we go on and it talks about the men, it talks about glory. But did you catch what, what was going on right here in the middle with women? I guarantee you the first thing you thought was short hair, wasn't it? I think short hair is relative. And compared to my hair, every woman in here has long hair. Okay, so you can thank me for that later. All right. That's not what my point is. My point is right here in verse 5. Um, every wife who prays or prophesies, how do you know when somebody's praying? How do you know when somebody's prophesying? What form of communication does that take? See, in the church, um, we pray, don't we? I mean, isn't that one of the things that we're called to, to pray for one another? Now, it's interesting because in, in these two examples, uh, words are being used, okay? Um, women are a lot better at using words than men are. 